17, embrace diversity, unite or be divided, robbed, ruled, killed by those who see you as prey. Embrace diversity or be destroyed. Earth Seed, the books of the living. Tuesday, August 3rd, 2027, from notes expanded August 8th. There's a big fire in the hills to the east of us. We saw it begin as a thin, dark column of smoke rising into an otherwise clear sky. Now it's massive, a hillside or two, several buildings, many houses, our neighborhood again. We kept looking at it, then looking away. Other people dying, losing their families, their homes. Even when we had walked past it, we looked back. Had the people with painted faces done this too? Zara was crying as she walked along cursing in a voice so soft that I could hear only a few of the bitter words. Earlier today, we left the 118 freeway to look for and finally connect with the 23. Now we're on the 23 with charred overgrown wilderness on one side and neighborhoods on the other. We can't see the fire itself now. We've passed it, come along away from it, put heels between it and us as we head southward toward the coast, but we can still see the smoke. We didn't stop for the night until it was almost dark and we were all tired and hungry. We've camped away from the freeway on the wilderness side of it, out of sight, but not out of hearing of the shuffling hordes of people on the move. I think that's a sound we'll hear for the whole of our journey, whether we stop in North California or go through to Canada. So many people hoping for so much up where it still rains every year and an uneducated person might still get a job that pays in money instead of beans, water, potatoes, and maybe a floor to sleep on. But it's the fire that holds our attention. Maybe it was started by accident, maybe not, but still people are losing what they may not be able to replace, even if they survive. Insurance isn't much worth these days. People on the highway, shadowy in the darkness, had begun to reverse the flow, to drift northward, to find a way to the fire. Best to be early for the scavenging. Should we go? Sarah asked, her mouth full of dried meat. We built no fire tonight. Best for us to vanish into the darkness and avoid guests. We have put a tangible, a tangle of trees and bushes at our backs and hope for the best. You mean go back and rob those people? Harry demanded. Scavenge, she said. Take what people don't need no more. If you're dead, you don't need much. We should stay here and rest, I said. We're tired and it will be a long time before things are cool enough over there to allow scavenging. It's a long way off anyway. Zara sighed. Yeah, we don't have to do things like that anyway, Harry said. Zara stroked. Every little bit helps. You were crying about that fire a while ago. Uh-huh. Zara drew her knees up against her body. I wasn't crying about that fire. I was crying about our fire and my BB and thinking about how much I hate people who set fires like that. I wish they would burn. I wish I could burn them. I wish I could just take them and throw them into the fire like they did my BB. And she began to cry again and he held her apologizing and I think shedding a few tears himself. Grief hit like that. Something would remind us of the past of home of a person and then we will remember that it was all gone. The person was dead or probably dead. Everything we'd known and treasured was gone. Everything except the three of us. And how well were we doing? I think we should move, Harry said sometime later. He was still sitting with Zara, one arm around her and she seemed to welcome the contact. Why, she asked. I want to be higher, closer to the level of the freeway or above it. I want to be able to see the fire if it jumps the freeway and spreads toward us. I want to see it before it gets too close. Fire moves fast. I groaned. You're right, I said, but moving now that it's dark is risky. We could lose this place and find nothing better. Wait here, he said, and got up and walked away into the darkness. I had the gun, so I hoped he kept his knife handy, and I hoped he wouldn't need it. He was still raw about what had happened the night before. He had killed a man. That bothered him. I had killed a man in a much more cold-blooded way, according to him, and it didn't bother me. But my cold-bloodedness bothered him. He wasn't a sharer. He didn't understand that to me, pain was the evil. Death was an end to pain. No Bible verses were going to change that as far as I was concerned. He didn't understand sharing. Why should he? Most people knew little or nothing about it. 
On the other hand, my Earthsea verses had surprised him and I think pleased him a little. I wasn't sure whether he liked the writing or the reasoning, but he liked having something to read and talk about. Poetry, he said this morning as he looked through the pages I showed him, pages of my Earthsea notebook. As it happened, I never knew you cared about poetry. A lot of it isn't very poetical, I said, but it's what I believe and I've written it as well as I could. I showed him four verses in all, gentle brief verses that might take hold of him without his realizing it and live in his memory without his intending that they should. Bits of the Bible had done that to me, staying with me even after I stopped believing. I gave to Harry and threw him to Zara, thoughts I wanted them to keep, but I couldn't prevent Harry from keeping other things as well. His new distrust of me, for instance, almost his new dislike. I was not quite Lauren Olamina to him anymore. I had seen that in his expression off and on all day. Odd, Joanne hadn't liked her glimpse of the real me either. On the other hand, Zara didn't seem to mind. But then she hadn't known me very well at home. What she learned now, she could accept without feeling lied to. Harry did feel lied to, and perhaps he wondered what lies I was still telling or living. Only time could heal that, if he let it. He moved when he came back. He had found us a new campsite near the freeway and yet private. One of the huge freeway signs that had fallen or been knocked down and now lay on the ground, propped up by a pair of dead sycamore trees. With the trees, it formed a massive lean-to. The rock and ash leavings of a campfire showed us that the place had been used before. Perhaps there had been people here tonight, but they had gone away to see what they could scavenge from the fire. Now we're here, happy to get a little privacy, a view of the hills back where the fire is, and the security for what it was worth of at least one wall. Good deal, Zara said, unrolling her sleep sack and settling down on top of it. I'll take the first watch tonight, okay? It was okay with me. I gave her the gun and lay down, eager for sleep. Again, I was amazed to find so much comfort in sleeping on the ground in my clothes. There's no narcotic-like exhaustion. Sometime in the night, I woke up to soft, small sounds of voices and breathing. Zara and Harry were making love. I turned my head and saw them at it, though they were too much involved with each other to notice me. And of course, no one was on watch. I got caught up in their lovemaking and had all I could do to lie still and keep quiet. I couldn't escape their sensation. I couldn't keep an efficient watch. I could either writhe with them or hold myself rigid. I held rigid until they finished, until Harry kissed Zara, then got up to put his pants on and began his watch. And I lay awake afterward, angry and worried. How in heck could I talk to either of them about this? It would be none of my business except for the time they chose for doing it. But look when that was, we could have all been killed. Still sitting up, Harry began to snore. I listened for a couple of minutes, then sat up, reached over Zara and shook him. He jumped awake, stared around, then turned toward me. I couldn't see more than a moving silhouette. Give me the gun and go back to sleep, I said. He just sat there. Harry, you'll get us killed. Give me the gun and the watch and lie down. I'll wake you later. He looked at the watch. Sorry, he said. Guess I was more tired than I thought. His voice grew less sleep fogged. I'm all right. I'm awake. Go back to sleep. His pride had kicked in. It would be almost impossible to get the gun and the watch from him now. I lay down. Remember last night, I said, if you care about her at all, if you want her to live, remember last night. He didn't answer. I hoped I had surprised him. I supposed I had also embarrassed him. And maybe I had made him feel angry and defensive. Whatever I'd done, I didn't hear him doing any more snoring. Wednesday, August 4th, 2027. Today we stopped at a commercial water station and filled ourselves and all our containers with clean, safe water. Commercial stations are best for that. Anything you buy from a water peddler on the freeway ought to be boiled and still might not be safe. Boiling kills disease organisms, but may do nothing to get rid of chemical residue. Fuel, pesticide, herbicide, whatever else has been in the bottles that peddlers use. The fact that most peddlers can't read makes the situation worse. They sometimes poison themselves. Commercial stations let you draw whatever you pay for, and not a drop more. Right out of one of their taps, you drink whatever the local householders are drinking. It might taste, smell, or look bad, but you can depend on it not to kill you. There aren't enough water stations. That's why water peddlers exist. Also, water stations are dangerous places. People give in having money. 
people come out having water, which is as good as money. Beggars and thieves hang around such places, keeping the whores and drug dealers company. Dad warned us all about water stations, trying to prepare us in case we were ever we ever went out and got caught far enough from home to be tempted to stop for water. His advice, don't do it. Suffer. Get your rear end home. Yeah. Three is the smallest comfortable number at a water station. Two to watch and one to fill up. And it's good to have three ready for trouble on the way to and from the station. Three would not stop determined thugs, but it would stop opportunists. And most predators are opportunists. They prey on old people, lone women or women with young kids, handicapped people. They don't want to get hurt. My father used to call them coyotes. When he was being polite, he called them coyotes. We were coming away with our water when we saw a pair of two-legged coyotes grab a bottle of water from a woman who was carrying a sizable pack and a baby. The man with her grabbed the coyote who had taken the water. The coyote passed the water to his partner and his partner ran straight into us. I tripped him. I think it was the baby who attracted my attention and my sympathy. The tough plastic bubble that held the water didn't break. The coyote didn't break either. I set my teeth, sharing the jolt as he fell and the pain of his scraped forearms. Back home, the younger kids hit me with that kind of thing every day. I stepped back from the coyote and put my hand on the gun. Harry stepped up beside me. I was glad to have him there. We looked more intimidating together. The husband of the woman had thrown off his attacker and the two coyotes, finding themselves outnumbered, scampered away. Skinny, scared little bastards out to do their daily stealing. I picked up the plastic bubble of water and handed it to the man. He took it and said, thanks, man. Thanks a lot. I nodded and we went on our way. It still felt strange to be called man. I didn't like it, but that didn't matter. All of a sudden, you're a good Samaritan, Harry said, but he didn't mind. There was no disapproval in his voice. It was the baby, wasn't it? Zara asked. Yes, I admit it. The family really, all of them together, all of them together. They have been a black man, a Hispanic looking woman, and a baby who managed to look a little like both of them. In a few more years, a lot of the families back in the neighborhood would have looked like that. Heck, Harry and Zara were working on starting a family like that. And as Zara had once observed, mixed couples catch heck out here. Yet there were Harry and Zara walking so close together that they couldn't help now and then brushing against each other. But they kept alert, looked around. We were on US 101 now, and there were even more walkers, even clumsy thieves would have no trouble losing themselves in this crowd. But Zara and I had had a talk this morning during her reading lesson. We were supposed to be working on the sounds of letters and the spelling of simple words. But when Harry went off to the bushes of our designated toilet area, I stopped the lesson. Remember what you said to me a couple of days ago, I asked her. My mind was wandering and you warned me. People get killed on freeways all the time, you said. To my surprise, she saw where I was headed at once. Thank you, she said, looking up from the paper I had given her. You don't sleep sound enough, that's all. She smiled as she said it. You want privacy? I'll give it to you, I said. Just let me know and I'll guard the camp from someplace a short distance away. You two can do what you want, but no more of this crap when you're on watch. She looked surprised. Didn't think you said words like that. And I didn't think you did things like that like last night. Dumb. I know. Fun, though. He's a big, strong boy, she paused. You jealous? Zara. Don't worry, she said. Things took me by surprise last night. I I needed something, someone. It won't be like that no more. Okay. You jealous, she repeated. I made myself smile. I'm as human as you are, I said, but I don't think I would have yielded to temptation out here with no prospects, no idea what's going to happen. The thought of getting pregnant would have stopped me cold. People have babies out here all the time, she grinned at me. What about you and that boyfriend of yours? We were careful. We used condoms. Zara shrugged. Well, Harry and me didn't. If it happens, it happens. It had apparently happened to the couple whose water we had saved. Now they had a baby to lug north. They stayed near us today, that couple. I saw them every now and then. Tall, stocky, velvet-skinned, deep black man carrying a huge pack. Short, pretty, stocky, light brown woman with baby in pack. Medium brown baby, a few months old, huge eyed baby with curly black hair. They rested when we rested. They're camped now not far behind us. They look more like potential allies than potential dangers, but I'll keep an eye on them. 
Thursday, August 5th, 2027. Late today, we came within sight of the ocean. None of us have ever seen it before and we had to go closer, look at it, camp within sight and sound and smell of it. Once we had decided to do that, we walked shoeless in the waves, pants, legs rolled up. Sometimes we just stood and stared at it. The Pacific Ocean, the largest, deepest body of water on earth, almost half a world of water, yet as it was, we couldn't drink any of it. Harry stripped down to his underwear and waded out until the cool water reached his chest. He can't swim, of course. None of us can swim. We've never before seen water enough to swim in. Zara and I watched Harry with a lot of concern. Neither of us felt free to follow him. I'm supposed to be a man, and Zara attracts enough of the wrong kind of attention with all her clothes on. We decided to wait until after sundown and go in fully clothed, just to wash away some of the grime and stink. Then we could change clothes. We both had soap and we were eager to make use of it. There were other people on the beach. In fact, the narrow strip of sand was crowded with people, though they managed to stay out of each other's way. They had spread themselves out and seemed far more tolerant of one another than they had during our night in the hills. I didn't hear any shooting or fighting. There were no dogs, no obvious steps, no rape. Perhaps the sea and the cool breeze lulled them. Harry wasn't the only one to strip down and go into the water. Quite a few women had gone out, wearing almost nothing. Maybe this was a safer place than we'd seen so far. Some people had tents and several had built fires. We settled in against the remnants of a small building. We were always, it seemed, looking for walls to shield us. Was it better to have them and perhaps get trapped against them or to camp in the open and be vulnerable on every side? We didn't know. It just felt better to have at least one wall. I salvaged a flat piece of wood from the building, went a few yards closer to the ocean and began to dig into the sand. I dug until I found dampness, then I waited. What's supposed to happen, Zara asked. Until now, she had watched me without saying anything. Drinkable water, I told her. According to a couple of books I read, water is supposed to seep up through the sand with most of the salt filtered out of it. She looked into the damp hole. When, she asked. I dug a little more. Give it time. If the trick works, we ought to know about it. It might save our lives someday. Or poison us or give us a disease, she said. She looked up to see Harry coming towards us, dripping wet. Even his hair was wet. He don't look bad naked, she said. He was still wearing his underwear, of course, but I could see what she meant. He had a nice, strong body, and I don't think he minded our looking at it, and he looked clean, and he didn't stink. I couldn't wait to get into the water. Go ahead, he said. It's sundown. I'll watch our stuff. Go. We got our soap out, gave him the gun, took off shoes and socks, and went. It was wonderful. The water was cold and it was hard to stand up in the waves and the sand kept being drawn away from our feet, even drawn from under our feet. But we threw water on each other and washed everything, clothing, bodies, and hair. Let the waves knock us around and laughed like crazy people. Best time I've had since we left home. Quite a lot of water had seeped into the hole. I dug by the time we got back to Harry. I tasted it, took a little up in my hand while Harry criticized me. Look at all the people in this dang place, he said. Do you see any bathrooms? What do you think they do out here? You ought to at least have the sense to use a water purification tablet. That thought was enough to make me spit out the mouthful of water that I had taken. He was right, of course. But that one mouthful had told me that I want what I wanted to know. The water had been a little brackish, but not bad. Drinkable. It should be boiled or a water purification tablet should be added to it, as Harry had said. And before that, according to my book, it could be strained through sand to get rid of some, more of the salt. That meant if we stayed near the coast, we could survive even if we ran short of water. That was good to know. We still had our shadows, the couple with the baby camped near us. And the woman was now sitting on the sand, nursing her baby while the man knelt beside his pack, rummaging through it. Do you think they want to wash? I asked Harry and Zara. What are you going to do, Zara responded, offer to babysit? I shook my head. No, I think that would be too much. Do either of you mind if I invite them over? Aren't you afraid they'll rob us, Harry demanded. You're afraid of everyone else. They have better gear than we do, I said, and they have no natural allies around here except us. Mixed couples or groups are rare out here. No doubt that's why they've kept close to us. And you helped them, Zara said. 
People don't help strangers too much out here. And you gave them back their water. That means you have enough so you don't have to rob them. So do you mind? I asked again. They looked at each other. I don't mind, Zara said, long as we keep an eye on them. Why do you want them? Harry asked, watching me. They need us more than we need them, I said. That's not a reason. They're potential allies. We don't need allies, not now, but we'd be fools to wait and try and get them when we do need them. By then, they might not be around. He shrugged and sighed. All right, like Zara says, as long as we watch them. I got up and went over to the couple. I could see them straighten and go tense as I approached. I was careful not to go too close or move too fast. Hello, I said. If you two would like to take turns bathing, you can come over and join us. That might be safer for the baby. Join you, the man said. You're asking us to join you? Inviting you. Why? Why not? We're natural allies, the mixed couple and the mixed group. Allies, the man said, and he laughed. I looked at him, wondering why he laughed. What the heck do you really want, he demanded. I sighed. Come join us if you want to. You're welcome. And in a pinch, five is better than two. I turned and left them. Let them talk it over and decide. They coming? Zara asked when I got back. I think so, I said. Although maybe not tonight. Friday, August 6, 2027. We built a fire and had a hot meal last night, but the Mix family did not join us. I didn't blame them. People stay alive out here by being suspicious, but they didn't go away either. And it was no accident that they had chosen to stay near us. It was a good thing for them that they were near us. The peaceful beach scene changed late last night. Dogs came onto the sand. They came during my watch. I saw movement far down the beach and I focused on it. Then there was shouting, screams. I thought it was a fight or a robbery. I didn't see the dogs until they broke away from a group of humans and ran inland. One of them was carrying something, but I couldn't tell what it was. I watched them until they vanished inland. People chased them for a short distance, but the dogs were too fast. Someone's property was lost, someone's food, no doubt. I was on edge after that. I got up, moved to the inland end of our wall, sat there where I could see more of the beach. I was there sitting still with a gun in my lap when I spotted movement perhaps a long city block up the beach. Dark forms against pale sand. More dogs, three of them. They nosed around the sand for a moment, then headed our way. I sat as still as I could, watching. So many people slept without posting watches. The three dogs wandered among the camps, investigating what they pleased, and no one tried to drive them away. On the other hand, people's oranges, potatoes, and grain meal couldn't be very tempting to a dog. Our small supply of dried meat might be another matter, but no dog would get it. But the dog stopped at the camp of the mixed couple. I remembered the baby and jumped up. At the same moment, the baby began to cry. I shoved Zara with my foot and she came awake all at once. She could do that. Dogs, I said, wait, Carrie. Then I headed for the mixed couple. The woman was screaming and beating at a dog with her hands. A second dog was dodging the man's kicks and going for the baby. Only the third dog was clear of the family. I stopped, slipped the safety, and as the third dog went in toward the baby, I shot it. The dog dropped without a sound. I dropped too, gasping, feeling kicked in the chest. It surprised me how hard the loose sand was to fall on. At the crack of the shot, the other two dogs took off inland. From my prone position, I sighted on them as they ran. I might have been able to pick off one more of them, but I let them go. I heard enough already. I couldn't catch my breath, it seemed. As I gasped, though, it occurred to me that prone was a good shooting position for me. Sharon would be less able to inca incapacitate me at once if I shot two-handed and prone. I filed the knowledge away for future use. Also, it was interesting that the dogs had been frightened by my shot. Was it the sound that scared them or the fact that one of them had been hit? I wish I knew more about them. I've read books about them being intelligent, loyal pets, but that's all in the past. Dogs now are wild animals who will eat a baby if they can. I felt that the dog I had shot was dead. It wasn't moving, but by now a lot of people were awake and moving around. A living dog, even wounded, would be frantic to get away. The pain in my chest began to ebb. When I could breathe without gasping, I stood up and walked back to our camp. There was so much confusion by then that no one no noticed me except Harry and Zara. 
Harry came out to meet me. He took the gun from my hand, then took my arm and steered me back to my sleep sack. So you hit something, he said as I sat, gasping again from the small exertion. I nodded. Kill the dog. I'll be okay soon. You need a keeper, he said. Dogs were after the baby. You've adopted those dang people. I smiled in spite of myself, liking him, thinking that I pretty much adopted him and Zara too. What's wrong with that, I asked. He sighed. Get in your bag and go to sleep, will you? I'll take the next watch. Some people just came and carried off the dog you killed, Zara said. We should have got it. I'm not ready to eat a dog yet, Harry told her. Go to sleep. The names of the members of the mixed family are Travis Charles Douglas, Gloria Natividad Douglas, and six-month-old Dominic Douglas, also called Domingo. They gave in and joined us tonight after we made camp. We've detoured away from the highway to make camp on another beach, and they followed. Once we were settled, they came over to us, uncertain and suspicious, offering us small pieces of their treasure, milk chocolate full of almonds, real mi milk chocolate, not carob candy. It was the best thing I tasted since long before leaving Roblado. It was you last night, Natividad asked Harry. The first thing she had told us was to call her Natividad. It was Lauren, Harry said, gesturing toward me. She looked at me. Thank you. Is your baby all right? I asked. He has scratches and sand in his eyes and mouth from being dragged. She stroked the sleeping baby's black hair. I put salve on the scratches and washed his eyes. He's all right now. He's so good. He only cried a little bit. Hardly ever cries, Travis said with a quiet pride. Travis has an unusual deep black complexion, skin so smooth that I can't believe he has ever in his life had a pimple. Looking at him makes me want to touch him and see how all that perfect skin feels. He's young, good looking and intense, a stocky muscular man, tall but a little shorter and a little heavier than Harry. Natividad is stocky too, a pale brown woman with a round pretty face, long black hair bound up in a coil atop her head. She's short, but it isn't surprising somehow that she can carry a pack and a baby and keep up a steady pace all day. I like her, feel inclined to trust her. I'll have to be careful about that, but I don't believe she would steal from us. Travis has not accepted us yet, but she has. We've helped her baby. We're her friends. We're going to Seattle, she told us. Travis has an aunt there. She says we can stay with her until we find work. We want to find work that pays money. Don't we all, Zara agreed. She sat on Harry's sleep sack with him, his arm around her. Tonight could be tiresome for me. Travis and Natividad sat on their three sacks, spread out to give their baby room to crawl when he woke up. Natividad had harnessed him to her wrist with a length of clothesline. I felt alone between the two couples. I let them talk about their hopes and rumors of Northern Edens. I took out my notebook and began to write up the day's events, still savoring the last of the chocolate. The baby awoke hungry and crying. Natividad opened her loose shirt, gave him a breast, and moved over near me to see what I was doing. You can read and write, she said with surprise. I thought you might be drawing. What are you writing? She's always writing, Harry said. Asked to read her poetry. Some of it isn't bad. I winced. My name is Androgynous, in pronunciation at least. Lauren sounds like the more masculine Lauren. But pronouns are more specific and still a problem for Harry. She, Travis asked right on cue, her? Dang it, Harry, I said. We forgot to buy that tape for your mouth. He shook his head, then gave me an embarrassed smile. I've known you all my life. It isn't easy to remember to switch all your pronouns. I think it's all right this time, though. I told you so, Natividad said to her husband. Then she looked embarrassed. I told him that you didn't look like a man, she said to me. You're tall and strong, but I don't know. You don't have a man's face. I had almost a man's chest and hips, so maybe I should be glad to hear that I didn't have a man's face though it wasn't going to help me on the road. We believe two men and a woman would be more likely to survive than two women and a man, I said. Out here, the trick is to avoid confrontation by looking strong. The three of us aren't going to help you look strong, Travis said. He sounded bitter. Did he resent the baby and the tivy died? You are our natural allies, I said. You sneered at that last time I said it, but it's true. The baby won't weaken us much, I hope and he'll have a better chance of surviving with five adults around him. 
I can take care of my wife and son, Travis said with more pride than sense. I decided not to hear him. I think you and Natividad will strengthen us, I said. Two more pairs of eyes, two more pairs of hands. Do you have knives? Yes, he patted his pants pocket. I wish we had guns like you. I wish we had guns, plural, too, but I didn't say so. You and Natividad look strong and healthy, I said. Predators will look at a group like the five of us and move on to easier prey. Travis grunted, still non-committal. Well, I had helped him twice, and now I was a woman. It might take him a while to forgive me for that, no matter how grateful he was. I want to hear some of your poetry, Natividad said. The man we worked for, his wife used to write poetry. She would read it to me sometimes when she was feeling lonely. I liked it. Read me something of yours before it gets too dark. I had to think of a rich woman reading to her maid, which was who Natividad had been. Maybe I had the wrong idea of rich women, but then everyone gets lonely. I put my journal down and picked up my book of earthseed verses. I chose soft, non-preachy verses, good for road-weary minds and bodies. 18. Once or twice each week, a gathering of earth seed is a good and necessary thing. It vents emotion, then quiets the mind. It focuses the attention, strengthens purpose, and unifies people. Earth seed, the books of the living. Sunday, August 8th, 2027. You believe in all this earth seed stuff, don't you? Travis asked me. It was our day off, our day of rest. We had left the highway to find a beach where we could camp for the day and night and be comfortable. The Santa Barbara beach we had found included a partially burned park where there were trees and tables. It wasn't crowded and we could find a little daytime privacy. The water was only a short walk away. The two couples took turns disappearing while I watched their packs and the baby. Interesting that the Douglases were already comfortable trusting me with all that was precious to them. We didn't trust them to watch alone last night or the night before, though we did make them watch. We had no walls to put our backs against last night, so it was useful to have two watchers at a time. The TV dad watched with me and Travis watched with Harry. Finally, Zara watched alone. I organized that feeling that it was the schedule that would be most comfortable to both couples. Neither would be required to trust the other too much. Now, amid the outdoor tables, fire pits, pines, palms, and sycamores, trust seems not to be a problem. If you turn your back to the burned portion, which is barren and ugly, this is a beautiful place, and is far enough from the highway not to be found by the ever-flowing river of people moving north. I found it because I had maps. In particular, a street map of much of Santa Barbara County. My grandparents' maps helped us explore away from the highway, even though many street signs were fallen or gone. There were enough left for us to find beaches when we were near them. There were locals at this beach, people who had left real homes to spend an August day at the beach. I eavesdropped on a few fragments of conversation and found out that much. Then I tired talking to some of them. To my surprise, most were willing to talk. Yes, the park was beautiful, except where some painted fools had set fires. The rumors were that they did it to fight for the poor, to expose or destroy the goods hoarded by the rich. But a park by the sea wasn't goods. It was open to everyone. Why burn it? No one knew why. No one knew where the fad of painting yourself and getting high on drugs and fire had come from either. Most people suspected it had begun in Los Angeles where, according to them, most stupid or wicked things began. Local prejudice. I didn't tell any of them I was from the LA area. I just smiled and asked about the local job situation. Some people said they knew where I could work to earn a meal or a safe place to sleep, but no one knew where I could earn money. That didn't mean there weren't any such jobs, but if there were, they would be hard to find and harder to qualify for. That's going to be a problem wherever we go. And yet we know a lot, the three of us, the five of us. We know how to do a great many things. There must be a way to pull it all together and make us something other than domestic servants working for room and board. We make an interesting unit. Water is very expensive here, worse than in Los Angeles or Ventura counties. We all went to a water station this morning, still no freeway water sellers for us. On the road yesterday, we saw three dead men, a group together, young, unmarked, but covered with the blood they had vomited, their bodies bloated and beginning to stink. We passed them, looked at them, 
took nothing from their bodies. Their packs, if they'd had any, were already gone. Their clothes, we did not want. And their canteens, all three still had canteens. Their canteens, no one wanted. We all resupplied yesterday at a local Hanning Joss. We were relieved and surprised to see it, a good dependable place where we could buy all we needed from solid food for the baby to soap and styles for skin chafed by salt water, sun, and walking. Nativity Dad bought new liners for her baby carrier and washed and dried a plastic bag of filthy old ones. Zara went with her into the separate laundry area of the store to wash and dry some of our filthy clothing. We wore our sea wash clothing, salty, but not quite stinking. Paying to wash clothes was a luxury we could not often afford, yet none of us found it easy to be filthy. We weren't used to it. We were all hoping for cheaper water in the north. I even bought a second clip for the gun, plus solvent, oil, and brushes to clean the gun. It had bothered me not being able to clean it before. If the gun failed us when we needed it, we could be killed. The new clip was a comfort too. It gave us a chance to reload fast and keep shooting. Now we lounged in the shade of pines and sycamores, enjoyed the sea breeze, rested, and talked. I wrote, fleshing out my journal notes for the week. I was just finishing that when Travis sat down next to me and asked his question. You believe in all this earth seed stuff, don't you? Every word, I answered. But you made it up. I reached down, picked up a small stone, and put it on the table between us. If I could analyze this and tell you all that it was made of, would that mean I would made up its contents? He didn't do more than glance at the rock. He kept his eyes on me. So what did you analyze to get earth seed? Other people, I said, myself, everything I could read, hear, see, all the history I could learn. My father is, was a minister and a teacher. My stepmother ran a neighborhood school. I had a chance to see a lot. What did your father think of your idea of God? He never knew. You never had the guts to tell him, I shrugged. He's the one person in the world I worked hard not to hurt. Dead? Yes. Yeah, my parents too. He shook his head. People don't live long these days. There was a period of silence. After a while, he said, how did you get your ideas about God? I was looking for God, I said. I wasn't looking for mythology or mysticism or magic. I didn't know whether there was a God to find, but I wanted to know. God would have to be a power that could not be de deified, defied by anyone or anything. Change, change, yes. But it's not a God. It's not a person or an intelligence or even a thing. It's just, I don't know, an idea. I smiled. Was that such a terrible criticism? It's a truth, I said. Change is ongoing. Everything changes in some way. Size, position, composition, frequency, velocity, thinking, whatever. Every living thing, every bit of matter, all the energy in the universe changes in some way. I don't claim that everything changes in every way, but everything changes in some way. Harry, coming in dripping from the sea, heard this last. Sort of like saying God is the second law of therm thermodynamics, he said, grinning. He and I had already had this conversation. That's an aspect of God, I said to Travis. Do you know about the second law? He nodded. Entropy, the idea that the natural flow of heat is from something hot to something cold, not the other way so that the universe itself is cooling down, running down, dissipating its energy. I let my surprise show. My mother wrote for newspapers and magazines at first, he said. She taught me at home. Then my father died and she couldn't earn enough for us to keep the house. And she couldn't find any work that paid money. She had to take a job as a living cook, but she went on teaching me. She taught you about entropy? Harry asked. She taught me to read and write, Travis said. Then she taught me to teach myself. The man she worked for had a library, a whole big room full of books. He let you read them, I asked. He didn't let me near them, Travis gave me a humorous, humorless smile. I read them anyway. My mother would sneak them to me. Of course, slaves did that 200 years ago. They sneaked around and educated themselves as best they could, sometimes suffering whipping, sale, or mutilation for their efforts. Did he ever catch you or her at it? I asked. No. Travis turned to look toward the sea. We were careful. It was important. She never borrowed more than one book at a time. I think his wife knew, but she was a decent woman. She never said anything. She was the one who talked him 
and to letting me marry Natividad, the son of the cook marrying one of the maids. That was like something out of another era too. Then my mother died and all Natividad and I had was each other and then the baby. I was staying on as a gardener handyman, but then the old bastard we worked for decided he wanted Natividad. He would try to watch when she fed the baby, couldn't let her alone. That's why we left. That's why his wife helped us leave. She gave us money. She knew it wasn't Natividad's fault and I knew I didn't want to have to kill the guy. So we left. In slavery, when that happened, there was nothing the slaves could do about it or nothing that wouldn't get them killed, sold or beaten. I looked at Natividad who sat a short distance away on spread out sleep sacks, playing with her baby and talking to Zara. She had been lucky. Did she know? How many other people were less lucky, unable to escape the master's attentions or gain the mistress's sympathies? How far did masters and mistresses go these days toward putting less than submissive servants in their places? I still can't see change or entropy as God, Travis said, bringing the conversation back to Earthseed. Then show me a more pervasive power than change, I said. It isn't just entropy. God is more complex than that. Human behavior alone should teach you that much. And there's still more complexity when you're dealing with several things at once, as you always are. There are all kinds of changes in the universe. He shook his head. Maybe, but nobody's going to worship them. I hope not, I said. Earthsea deals with ongoing reality, not with supernatural authority figures. Worship is no good without action. With action, it's only useful if it steadies you, focuses your efforts, eases your mind. He gave me an unhappy smile. Praying makes people feel better even when there's no action they can take, he said. I used to think that was all God was good for, to help people like my mother stand what they had to stand. That isn't what God is for, but there are times when that's what prayer is for, and there are times when that's what these verses are for. God is changed, and in the end, God prevails. But there's hope in understanding the nature of God, not punishing or jealous, but an infinitely malleable. There's comfort in realizing that everyone and everything yields to God. There's power in knowing that God can be focused, diverted, shaped by anyone at all. But there's no power in having strength and brains and yet waiting for God to fix things for you to take revenge for you. You know that. You knew it when you took your family and got the heck out of your boss's house. God will shape us all every day of our lives. Best to understand that and return the effort. Shape God. Amen, Harry said, smiling. I looked at him, wavered between annoyance and amusement, and let amusement win. Put something on before you burn, Harry. You sounded like you could use an amen, he said as he put on the loose blue shirt. Do you want to go on preaching or do you want to eat? We had beans cooked with bits of dried meat, tomatoes, peppers, and onions. It was Sunday. There were public fire pits in the park and we had plenty of time. We even had a little wheat flour bread and the baby had real baby food with his milk instead of mashed or mother chewed bits of whatever we were eating. It's been a good day. Every now and then, Travis would ask me another question or toss me another challenge to Earthseed and I would try to answer without preaching him a sermon, which was hard. I think I managed it most of the time. Zara and Natividad got into an argument about whether I was talking about a male God or a female God. When I pointed out the change had no sex at all and wasn't a person, they were confused but not dismissive. Only Harry refused to take the discussion seriously. He liked the idea of keeping a journal though. Yesterday he bought a small notebook and now he's writing too and helping Zara with her reading and writing lessons. I'd like to draw him into Earthseed. I'd like to draw them all in. They could be the beginning of an Earthseed community. I would love to teach Dominic Earthseed as he grows up. I would teach him and he would teach me. The questions little children ask drive you insane because they never stop, but they also make you think. For now though, I had to deal with Travis's questions. I took a chance. I told Travis about the destiny. He had asked and asked me what the point of earth seed is. Why personify change by calling it God? Since change is just an idea, why not call it that? Just say change is important. Because after a while, it won't be important, I told him. People forget ideas. They're more likely to remember God, especially when they're scared or desperate. Then they're supposed to do what, he demanded, read a poem? 
or remember a truth or a comfort or a reminder to action, I said. People do that all the time. They reach back to the Bible, the Talmud, the Quran, or some other religious book that helps them deal with the frightening changes that happen in life. Change does scare most people. I know, God is frightening. Best to learn to cope. Your stuff isn't very comforting. It is after a while. I'm still growing into it myself. God isn't good or evil, doesn't favor you or hate you, and yet God is better partnered than fought. Your God doesn't care about you at all, Travis said. All the more reason to care about myself and others. All the more reason to create earthsea communities and shape God together. God is trickster, teacher, chaos, clay. We decide which aspect we embrace and how to deal with the others. Is that what you want to do? Set up earthsea communities? Yes. And then what? There it was, the opening. I swallowed and turned a little so that I could see the burned over area. It was so ugly, hard to think anyone had done that on purpose. And then what, Travis insisted. A God like yours wouldn't have a heaven for people to hope for. So what is there? Heaven, I said, facing him again. Oh yes, heaven. He didn't say anything. He gave me one of his suspicious looks and waited. The destiny of Earthseed is to take root among the stars, I said. That's the ultimate Earthseed aim and the ultimate human change short of death. It's the destiny we better pursue if we hope to be anything other than smooth-skinned dinosaurs. Here today, gone tomorrow, our bones mixed with the bones and ashes of our cities, and so what? Space, he said. Mars? Beyond Mars, I said. Other star systems, living worlds. You're crazy, he said. But I like the soft, quiet way he said it, with amazement rather than ridicule. I grinned. I know it won't be possible for a long time. Now is the time for building foundations, earthy communities focused on the destiny. After all, my heaven really exists and you don't have to die to reach it. The destiny of earthy is to take root among the stars or among the ashes. I nodded toward the burned area. Travis listened. He didn't point out that a person walking north from LA to who knows where with all her possessions on her back was hardly in a position to point the way to Alpha Centauri. He listened. He laughed a little as though he were afraid to get caught between being too serious about my ideas. But he didn't back away from me. He leaned forward. He argued. He shouted. He asked more questions. Natividad told him to stop bothering me, but he kept it up. I didn't mind. I understand persistence. I admire it. Sunday, August 15, 2027. I think Travis Charles Douglas is my first convert. Zara Moss is my second. Zara has listened the days pass, and as Travis and I went on arguing off and on, sometimes she asked questions or pointed out what she saw as inconsistencies. After a while, she said, I don't care about no outer space. You can keep that part of it. But if you want to put together some kind of community where people look out for each other, I don't have to take being pushed around. I'm with you. I've been talking to Natividad. I don't want to live the way she had to. I don't want to live the way my mama had to either. I wondered how much difference there was between Natividad's former employer who treated her as though he owned her and Richard Moss who purchased young girls to be part of his harem. It was all a matter of personal feeling, no doubt. Natividad had resented her employer. Zara had accepted and perhaps loved Richard Moss. Earthseed is being born right here on Highway 101. On that portion of 101 that was once El Camino Real, the Royal Highway of California's Spanish Pass, now it's a highway, a river of the poor, a river flooding north. I've come to think that I should be fishing that river even as I follow its current. I shall watch people not only to spot those who might be dangerous to us, but to find those few like Travis and Natividad who will join us and be welcome. And then what? Find a place to squat and take over? Act as a kind of gang? No, not quite a gang. We aren't gang types. I don't want gang types with their need to dominate, rob, and terrorize. And yet we might have to dominate. We might have to rob to survive and even terrorize to scare off or kill enemies. We'll have to be very careful how we allow our needs to shape us, but we must have arable land, a dependable water supply, and enough freedom from attack 
to let us establish ourselves and grow. It might be possible to find such an isolated place along the coast and make a deal with the inhabitants. If there were a few more of us, and if we were better armed, we might provide security in exchange for living room. We might also provide education plus reading and writing services to adult illiterates. There might be a market for that kind of thing. So many people, children and adults are illiterate these days. We might be able to do it, grow our own food, grow ourselves and our neighbors into something brand new, into Earthseed.